بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى conclusion from yesterday was kasb al halal min umur al din that earning a halal livelihood and we also added to halal tayyib as well and we also looked at the difference that every tayyib will be halal but every halal does not necessarily have to be tayyib i never gave any examples on purpose if i did and somebody is engaged in type of, that type of trade etc then it just creates unnecessary finger pointing etc but we looked into good de- you know in great detail into halal and tayyib so that was the conclusion that earning a halal livelihood is part of our deen it's part of our deen and the other thing to appreciate is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed the responsibility of providing food shelter etc for example for your wife for your dependents i.e your children upon the male the male is responsible for this there is no obligation in sharia upon the female to provide any of these things so that's something which we need to really appreciate and understand and i'll just give you a small example because generally if you've got a father a husband he is going to provide for his wife and children but i'll give you another example let's say there is someone and his parents they are poor they are in need they don't have enough financial resources to sustain themselves now who does the responsibility fall upon there is a hierarchy and in that hierarchy the male siblings i.e the children the male children of those parents sharia has placed the obligation upon them even though there could be daughters as well usually what happens is who looks after the parents more come on the daughters the daughters it might not be um financially more in other aspects but the daughters nowadays you will see that they will drop everything and they will come and be at the side of their parents okay because the husband he sold himself to his wife okay don't take that literally but this is important to appreciate that basically if your parents are in hardship the responsibility falls upon the male i e the the children the male children of that parent basically so if there were two males for example two sons they would have to share that responsibility equally so if those parents for example need you know they might have stopped working they might be getting a little tiny pension and you know everything is on the decrease nowadays in terms of pensions etc from the government or whatever and prices are rising every day food etc utilities so they might have a shortfall in their income let's say of 50 pounds every week they need 50 pounds to meet everything so one son he will give 25 pounds he will contribute and the other will also contribute 25 pounds what they can't do is if they've got two more sisters they ring them up and say oi you need to give some as well because sharia has placed no responsibility upon them yes if they gave from their own free will that's a separate issue but sharia has placed no obligation therefore these two sons they cannot demand from their sisters that you need to basically contribute as well another example i'll give you is father is responsible for his daughter till the day she gets married the father he is responsible for his daughter till the day she gets married basically there's more detail into this but again for this daughter there is really no obligation from sharia to provide for herself or for anybody else uh, basically so keeping this in mind so much responsibility upon the male that's why when it comes to inheritance he gets basically you know a bigger share than the sister that is one of the reasons he gets a bigger share than the sister usually a um, lot of people ask this question especially the females that why is it like this well this is the reason 
But sadly, if we look at the norm nowadays that we're the first ones to collect the inheritance, but when it comes to fulfilling our obligations, the ones I've just mentioned, basically, that, okay, father might have passed away, mother is still alive, she needs looking after, maybe financially she might need looking after, but everybody's at the back of the queue there. But when it comes to collecting the inheritance, everybody is at the front of the queue. So this is something to keep in mind and very important because this now brings us to our topic, Qasbul Halal. That when the male has got so many responsibilities upon his shoulders, earning a livelihood, in particular earning a halal livelihood, is necessary upon that male. And this is the mindset we should be creating in our children as well. That when you grow up, it's not just a job. It's not just a profession. You are responsible to provide for your dependents, be it your wife, be it your children, be it your parents, basically. Moving on from there, I, I wanted to go into um, some other things like, you know, it's not the husband's or the father's responsibility to provide lavish holidays or designer goods or takeouts every week or going to eat in the restaurant, etc. That doesn't fall under his shari responsibilities, although these have become, you know, self-obligated responsibilities nowadays. And because of that, one income does not suffice. One income no longer, unfortunately, suffices, basically. Because if you don't have that trip to Dubai every year, basically, you feel that, okay, this year is not complete. Basically, so you need two incomes if you are going to sustain and maintain a lifestyle like that. I thought I'll just mention that in the middle of topic. Moving on, like we said, halal, we also discussed yesterday that our children, we need to mold them towards a profession and a career which lets them, you know, live humanely. For example, we've got the month of Ramadan. They should be able to, at least in the month of Ramadan, you know, contribute two hours, maybe three hours during the day towards ibadah, taraweeh, etc. You know, without any pressure of work, profession, etc. That's the type of job you want to go into that lets you breathe. In addition to that, you know, your family, your children, you can devote enough time to them. Not that you leave at 7 o'clock in the morning, so you must have woke up at 6 o'clock to leave at 7 o'clock, and you return at home at 7 o'clock at night in the evening, tired, kadu nai kadu, and you've fallen asleep on the sofa, basically. That's not the way to live. Wallahi, that's not the way to live, especially for a believer. Especially for a believer. So, some professions... You know, they're a complete no-go area for Muslims. Banking is one of them. Banking is one of them. Okay? It involves riba. Whether you're a cashier, whether, whether you're a financial advisor in the bank. You know, this is a no-go area. I meet a lot of our ex-Madrissa students and, you know, I always talk to them and I ask them, what are you doing? And some say, I've become financial advisor. And I then ask them where oh, I'm working in this bank. Allah, by, why did you not think about your career from before? That you've ended up in this, basically, profession, which, you know, for a believer, it's not befitting. Allah has declared war on riba in the Qur'an. Allah has declared war on riba in the Qur'an, and your profession is basically promoting that. The whole uh, banking sector basically is based on that. Where do they derive their profits from? You know, 90%, even I think 95% of their profits, they derive from interest, from riba. They live and breathe on that. Another industry is, for example, gambling, alcohol, music. You know, I'm talking about industries here, actual professions. You know, these are complete no-go areas for Muslims. At the same time, you know, what we've got to appreciate that there's some professions, there's nothing wrong with joining that profession, but it might not be the best choice. It might not be the best choice. And I'll give you a few examples. Because if you go in that profession, you've got to work extra hard to prove yourself. These professions generally are what? Male, white, male-dominated professions. You know, Safed Gori, uska bhi number nahi aata. Jab uska number nahi aata, hamara number kaise aayega? 
Do you understand? These are those professions which are dominated by white males. And come on, what's been in the news for the last 10 days? Who's going to tell me? Who has been basically, literally, they've been um, sacrificed and slated by a report? Come on. You know, guys, watch the news. The Casey report, come on. Nobody here? Ya Allah. Sorry? Boris Johnson to hey. Come on, man. The Casey report, what is it about? This is bad news. Okay. The Met, the Metropolitan Police. The Casey report came out a few days ago. And what did it say? It's rotten to the core. This is supposed to be the largest police force in the United Kingdom. Yeah? All the major units like terrorism, etc., they come under their remit. At the click of a finger, they can send the one down to Preston to arrest somebody under terrorism and they can bypass the local police. The report said this organization is rotten to the core. And the reason is because there is racism and discrimination on an institutional level. And just look at some of the examples. Sikh police officer in the Met. What was he made to do? Come on. If you never knew about the actual report, I don't expect you to know the few niggly details. He was made to cut his beard by his colleagues, whether as a joke, whether as some banter. But the point I'm making is, come on, this is a serious matter. He was made to cut his beard. Women officers in the Met, they've been abused and degraded. If they want promotion, they've got to lick the boots of their male white counterparts. No ifs, no buts. That's in the report. I'm not saying this. Another example. There was a Muslim police officer. What was placed inside his locker? Come on. Bacon. Bacon. Hurry, somebody's awake. Mashallah. Okay, yes. So Now, just imagine. Okay, they've got their targets to meet. They want more officers from the ethnic minority. Why would you want to join an organization like this where you are, you know, basically doomed to failure from the start? You are doomed to failure from the start. You know, this is the Met today in 2023. 25 years ago, there was a similar report regarding the Met. Same conclusion, rotten to the core. After whose death? Come on. Stephen Lawrence. After Stephen Lawrence's death, there was an investigation into the Met. Same report 25 years ago. You'd think that in 25 years, something will have improved. Nothing has improved. Now for a Muslim... The female got the chordo. Fatima, Aisha, Jamila, Jekai bin Amhoi. Forget them. For Muslim male to basically join the ranks of the Met, why would you want to do that in an organization like this? And you might have good intentions. I'm going to change things from within. Alabai, nothing's changed for 25 years. And I don't think nothing is going to change for the next five years or 10 years, basically, unless the government takes radical action. So this is just one example of a profession. Nothing wrong with becoming a police officer in any police force, but there, there's certain police forces. I don't know about Lancashire, where they stand uh, inside this, basically. Okay, but the Met, the Met, usually people want to join the Met because of the status, the rank, etc. It brings the privileges, it brings, you know, you can potentially climb the ranks, etc. Uh, and uh, if you're a hardworking Asian, you've got, you know, maybe few opportunities because they have to tick those boxes. They have to tick those boxes. But why do you want to join an organization where you are going to make your life difficult? You are going to make your life difficult. So this is something which we need to think about as parents and help our children when they make that career choice, um, basically. Another example I'll give you, very close to the police, the fire service. Fire service is no different. White male dominated. White male dominated, basically. Asian person walking inside working with 12, 15 white males, basically the ones who go to the pub every Friday, Saturday, they'll probably get stoned, drunk, etc. You know, why do you want to basically put yourself into an environment like that? Okay, do you understand? You know, this is, again, something really to think about. Usually you get people, they make a career choice, they go into that career after a few months, forget one year, two years, just after a few months, they feel regret. And they try to look for a way out, but then it's difficult. 
because they chose a specific qualification and that qualification has led them to here, it's very difficult to get out. So as parents, we need to guide our children. And just a final example, becoming a politician, becoming an MP, okay? I don't know about local councillors, okay, but I'm talking about MPs here. You know, we need Muslim representation in parliament. There is no doubt about that, okay? We need Muslim representation at the highest levels. But what you've got to appreciate is when a person becomes a politician and they don't have basically the strength, the stamina to stand up for their own values and principles, what happens? Come on, you've got to sell everything what you stand up for, including your deen and your iman, including your deen and your iman. I'll give an example of politicians who stand up for what they believe in. Look at that Jacob Rees Mogg. You all know him. Come on, you must have heard of his name. Very strong Christian. He has very strong views. He's straight no to gay marriage. You tell me one Muslim MP who has stood up and said that. Very strong views. He doesn't uh, subscribe to all this um, gender identity damal as well. Very clear in his views. And when he was interviewed once, okay, uh, I think BBC or Sky News, you know what he said to the person who was interviewing him? My religious views are none of your concern to politics. Ki si baat kar, baki sab chor de. You, know, you talk about politics. Forget my religious views. Which Muslim MP is going to say that? You tell me. And I'll just give you a live example. Before I give you the live, live example, just look at our Rishi. Rishi Sunak, when he was campaigning to be the leader of the Conservative Party against Liz Truss. What did he do? Where did he go to? And he was basically slated in the media for that. Come on, where did he go? pub. And by the guy has never drunk in his life. He's never drank alcohol. He doesn't drink alcohol. But just to win the votes, he went inside the pub. The media picked up on this and they really had a go at him. That you, you know, Dordaya, why you went inside the pub for when you know, we all know you don't drink. Basically. So it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do. You will either sell your deen and iman at the same time you're not going to gain anything. Live example, Who's, which Muslim is trying to become the first minister of Scotland? Come on, what's his name? Hamza Yusuf. The Scots say Humza Yusuf or something like that. But we'll just call him Hamza Yusuf. Hamza Yusuf wants to become the first minister. We'll find out on Monday, probably by afternoon, whether he's uh, succeeded or not. He's sold everything. He has given up everything. What do I mean by that? Can anybody tell me? What's the big issue in Scotland which has, they say, potentially been one of the reasons uh, of the downfall of, what's her name, uh, Nicola Sturgeon? Basically, the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. In a nutshell, what that was is, which was passed, passed in the Scottish Parliament, a 16-year-old at the age of 16 can wake up in the morning, you know, they were born as John, but he can declare himself to be Janet, go into some office, and get some certificate and say that today, from today, I am a female. Simple as that. This was passed inside the Scottish Parliament. But uh, luckily, alhamdulillah, at least those in Westminster, unke pastor, kuch akalti, they basically vetoed that. First time in the history of uh, Scotland, the Westminster ever, ever vetoed one of their laws, basically. They said, no, no, we can't have this. We can't have this. Okay. What has Hamza Yusuf said? If I become first minister of Scotland, you know, I'm going to basically uh, bring the gender recognition reform bill back. He's fully up for abortion. He's fully up for gay marriage. And he's fully up for tr uh, trans self ID. Come on, man. Just to win what? Votes. Just to become the first minister of Scotland. He's basically giving up everything he should be standing up for. And just look on the opposite end. There's two more people, two females, who also want to become the first minister of Scotland. One of them is Kate Forbes and the other is Ash Reagan. Kate Forbes, strong Christian. She said straight up from the first day, I'm against gay, gay marriage. I'm against the gender rec recognition reform bill. And I don't subscribe to tra trans uh, self ID. Straight. The other one is no different as well. Ash Reagan as well. She has also said, I don't basically subscribe to the gender recognition reform bill. So can you see, you got one side, one guy is Muslim, Hamza Yusuf. 
نام بھی ہے یوسف علیہ السلام کا and then on the other side you've got two non-muslims who are standing up for what they believe in who are standing up for what they believe in what we believe in basically but can you see for this person muslim person to succeed in this arena he has got to basically you know tour the narrative of the party members you know snp members mainly young young under 30s under 35 and they subscribe to all this nonsense so he's subscribing as well and what do they call hamza yusuf the continuity candidate you know he's the uh, you know nikola sturgeon 2.0 whatever you want to call that so you know again politics is something before you step foot inside you need to think carefully you know am i going to be able to stand up for the principle the values which i believe in you know which are humane values which are values which are in line with fitra basically am i going to be able to stand up for that and articulate myself properly if not wallahi it's not worth entering that and giving up your deen and iman how long how long are you going to live for you might become an mp for 20 years 25 years uske baad kya hai jana hai and you, for the sake of some little fame and sitting in parliament etc you are basically giving up everything what you stand up for may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah will continue tomorrow give us the ability and tawfiq to first of all earn a halal livelihood and secondly may allah give us the ability to mold and guide our children accordingly jazakallah